Hello and welcome to the webinar on Trap Cropping in Organic Strawberry Production by Diego Nieto of the University of California at Santa Cruz. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very glad to have Diego Nieto with us today. Diego is an entomological researcher at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he has worked to address pest issues in commercial agriculture for 12 years. He has researched biological control, farmscaping, and integrated pest management in cotton, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and strawberries. So the, yeah, the talk I'm going to be giving is trap cropping and organic strawberries. Uh, this has certainly been um, a collaborative effort um, between uh, UC Santa Cruz, the USDA, and the CDFA as well. <clears throat> uh, so the pest that we'll be talking about uh, is a very common pest, um, Ligus hesperus, um, or Ligus bug for short. Um, there are several different Ligus bugs um, that are uh, pests in, in various crops in, in various parts of the country and indeed various parts of the world. Um, we do have more than one species um, in strawberries on the central coast of California, um, but most of the efforts um, and most of it has been done with, with the species. <clears throat> so Ligus bugs, uh, myrids and uh, bugs in general, true bugs in the order of Hemiptera, um, are challenging, um, for, and one of the reasons that they're so challenging um, is because of their um, ability to feed with um, a very specialized um, beak-like mouth structure called a rostrum. And you can see uh, sort of the profile of the Ligus bug adult in the top right-hand corner of the picture and sort of the diagram uh, that's inverted with respect to its orientation um, uh, in the bottom left-hand side of the picture. Uh, with, in the case of Ligus bugs, um, this allows them to feed on um, plant tissue, uh, seeds, fruit, um, stems, uh, it really um, gives them an advantage in being able to, to use that rostrum to, to penetrate on various sorts of tissues um, and feed from in a variety of manners. Uh, the next slide has a Ligus bug nymph. <clears throat> uh, so true bugs um, do not undergo complete metamorphosis. Uh, instead, they have uh, nymphal instars um, that sort of progressively mature. You can see the wing pads um, on this um, older nymph, um, and it has the same exact mouth part, that same rostrum beak-like beak uh, mouth structure that allows it to feed. Uh, the egg on the bottom left-hand corner of the slide is inserted into uh, stems, um, and so it's difficult to access, um, at least the, the thinking is that it's difficult to access uh, for predators and parasitoids, largely, at least the ones that are, that are most common um, in Central Coast strawberries. Um, there is some thinking that some other true bugs can access it. Um, that may be the case, but uh, we need to, to do some more research to, to verify that. Uh, just to give you a, a, a notion of the scale um, of how small these insects are, here's a, a posterior view of a nymph on a developing strawberry. <clears throat> so for those of you who aren't familiar with um, sort of how a strawberry plant develops uh, and produces fruit uh, with respect to uh, this pest's feeding behavior. Uh, so you can see the flowers um, <clears throat> as they mature, and you can see uh, various stages of strawberry development here on this plant. <clears throat> um, the petals fall off, the receptacle enlarges, um, and when Ligus um, bug feeding has, has occurred on the flower, um, as you can see on this next slide, <clears throat> the achenes, which are the sort of the seed-like structures on the outside of the strawberry, um, their endosperm has been removed. It's, it's hollowed out by the, the ligus feeding. As a result, they can't release uh, the hormones and other chemicals to ensure proper uh, growth, even growth, um, among the entirety of the fruit. And so instead, you get very uneven fruit, <clears throat> um, which is called cat-faced uh, strawberries in English or jungle. Uh, monkey in Spanish, um, so there's <laughs> certainly cultural differences in how you uh, prescribe this look to, to a, a various animal, but um, it's uneven, it's cosmetic damage um, that, uh, that produces these fresh market yield losses 
um, which are so important for strawberry growers um, given the high cost of producing this fruit. <clears throat> so Ligus bugs on the central coast, uh, they immigrate uh, in the springtime, uh, females uh, lay eggs in the fields, uh, again that's late spring, early summer. You then have <clears throat> basically two generations uh, in the strawberries in the fields in the summer. Uh, and it's the nymphs that are thought to do most of the damage. So it's it's not the immigrating um, adults that really do damage. It's the it's the nymphs that are thought to do most of the cosmetic and, and therefore uh, contribute to most of the yield losses. Uh, and then at the end of the second generation, uh, in the fall, uh, those adults overwinter either in the field or they fly into neighboring weeds to, to overwinter and start the process all over again. <clears throat> So this next slide is um, an abbreviated list of plant hosts um, that ligus bugs are capable of utilizing for food. Um, the complete list, or one, one of the lists that is available, um, was done uh, by Scott in 1977, um, and it shows that for ligus hespers, they can feed on over 200 uh, different species of plants. Um, so this is a true generalist. Um, it is capable of um, utilizing many different sorts of plants, and again, plant parts, uh, for food. <clears throat> and this is important um, as it relates to strawberry biology uh, and plant host preference, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, more broadly, some of the challenges um, to ligus bug management uh, specific to Central Coast strawberries and, and their organic production um, are several. Uh, first, there really aren't um, any organically compliant insecticides that are uh, sort of affordable um, and that are broadly considered or widely considered effective. Um, also, <clears throat> it's not, uh, you can certainly scout a field um, for ligus bugs, um, but it does take a tremendous amount of effort. Um, the more um, obvious indication of a ligus bug presence uh, is, is uh, cat based or crooked fruit, um, but that's an indication that ligus bugs were there, not necessarily that they are there currently. Um, there's a gap of about 21 days between when a ligus um, fed on a flower and when that fruit uh, matures and, and gets crooked. Um, so there's, a, there's not uh, a really obvious um, and convenient way to um, identify both spatially and temporally where uh, these ligus bug pest populations are in the field. <clears throat> uh, for large-scale strawberry production, the most common form of pest control is uh, tractor-mounted vacuums. Uh, they're, they're three to four hoods um, that are fixed either in the front or the back of a tractor. Um, they go through and they just vacuum up um, every strawberry row. Uh, in terms of fuel, maintenance, um, and labor costs, this is relatively expensive and it's also very indiscriminate, right? So a vacuum is not going to discriminate between a pest uh, and uh, a beneficial insect. And then finally, the beneficial insects that are present in a field that are naturally occurring in a strawberry field, um, particularly generalist predators, are not usually sufficient um, to maintain pest populations below, econom below economic thresholds um, for an entire year. Um, usually you're fine um, through the spring and early summer, but by the time you get to mid to late summer, um, ligus populations have really, really ramped up. <clears throat> And so as a response to uh, these challenges, uh, we began working uh, on a trap cropping program um, to begin to address this. And we feel that uh, this program, this comprehensive program, really does um, address some of these challenges um, in, a, in a really positive way. <clears throat> so trap crops. Right, they work not exclusively, but in this case, they work on, um, based on the notion that um, polyphagous insects, in other words, insects that can feed on many different crops, um, they are going to have inherent preferences for uh, one plant or a group of plants, and you can utilize that uh, plant host preference um, to your advantage. <clears throat> so in this case, of course, we're using alfalfa um, as a preferred host um, for ligus to, to choose over strawberries. So it's been known since uh, the 70s when um, the, the first studies were done on alfalfa trap crops um, in cotton. Uh, 
in the Central Valley that this was absolutely a preferred host uh, for Ligus bugs. Um, and since that time, uh, Blackmer uh, et al. 2004 is a great example. Um, the compounds, the, the chemical cues that are emitted by alfalfa that um, help to stimulate Ligus um, attraction um, have been identified. So in the bottom left-hand corner uh, of the slide, <clears throat> there are volatile compounds that are being measured in nanograms per hour. Um, and you can see this tall um, bar, for example, um, gets uh, it emits a lot of volatile comp compounds um, for uh, alfalfa flowers um, that have been fed upon by adults. So there's this sort of combination of um, insect feeding um, and plant damage um, that emits a lot of this particular compound. Um, and so there are lots of um, uh, sort of this combination of um, flower presence and feeding that is very um, sort of strongly attractive to this, this insect. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so with that, we have a basis of attraction for ligus bugs um, moving into alfalfa trap crops. <clears throat> and so this attraction can first be utilized um, in the spring, right? We have an immigrating um, a group of adults, right, um, that are perfectly content in the spring. And you can see in the foreground, uh, we have um, really beautiful sort of green flowering hillsides in California. Um, but of course, in the Mediterranean climate, as spring turns to summer, um, all of those um, flowering plants uh, that host lots of, of uh, adult ligus, they dry out. Uh, ligus are then forced, forced to uh, look for um, something green. And of course, they oftentimes they see large expansive fields of strawberries. And so they migrate into those strawberry fields. <clears throat> uh, so we've been collaborating with James Hagler um, at the USDA in Arizona. Um, and he has been uh, able to um, provide uh, some protein marking techniques to document movement of ligus bugs. Um, and it's been very helpful, uh, primarily, uh, well, in several different regards. But first, uh, we use it in the spring. I don't know if you can see, so this is uh, um, Scott Mackley. He has a backpack sprayer, um, and there's a white substance that's being um, uh, deposited on largely radish um, on the side of a, an alfalfa, I'm sorry, a strawberry uh, filled with alfalfa trap crops. And so this is either, I can't tell if it's either milk or egg white, <clears throat> a diluted solution that's being applied to um, these adjacent weeds. And here's Scott again. Um, and some, some sort of waist-high uh, radish uh, applying that protein mark. Uh, we then use sweet nets and or um, uh, bug vacs, handheld bug vacs. Um, these are sort of handheld vacuums that allow us to uh, collect uh, ligus, especially in strawberries. Uh, the architecture of a strawberry plant doesn't allow for a sweet net. Um, and so these bug vacs have been really, really great at uh, uh, collecting uh, Ligus sample. Uh, so this is data from 2009. <clears throat> uh, so here are the weeds that were marked um, with the protein solution. And we are looking at the number of marked Ligus Hesperus adults on a, on a given date. Uh, in the legend, uh, you can see that we're looking at, um, we, we made collections 24 hours, 48 hours, and two weeks after the protein application was made to the weed. Uh, those collections were made in alfalfa and strawberries uh, that were very close to um, or adjacent to the weeds that were applied with protein, and then also alfalfa trap crops and strawberries that were farther away. Um, and you can see in this first year, uh, we have pretty low numbers, um, but there does definitely seem to uh, be a preference uh, for alfalfa um, 12 out of 13 Ligus Hesperus adults that were captured um, and marked flew into alfalfa rather than strawberries. In 2010, we have a, a, an identical pattern but with uh, better numbers. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have 29 out of 34 adults that were captured and marked um, in a strawberry field um, that chose to immigrate into an alfalfa trap crop rather than a strawberry plant. And for 
anyone is familiar with um, organic pest management, you know that the first line of defense, arguably the most important line of defense, um, is prevention. Uh, because organic growers don't have chemical tools um, that can address sort of very uh, serious pest challenges, prevention is absolutely the first line of defense, and this gives you that. <clears throat> so here we have this, these organic barriers with a line of defense that um, if, if that female flies into an alfalfa trap crop and lays her eggs um, into that trap crop, then you've greatly mitigated um, the likelihood of yield loss by that first generation. Okay, so we know that uh, ligus bugs are attracted to and uh, begin to aggregate pretty greatly um, in alfalfa trap crops. Uh, but what happens um, with respect to the possibility of their um, sort of spilling over or leaving a trap crop um, back into the strawberries? And we definitely learned the hard way very early on in this project, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that trap crop management is absolutely necessary um, for this system to be successful. Um, you cannot rely alone on uh, plant host attractiveness. You also have to integrate an element of management into this trap crop. And if you look at the literature, they very rarely uh, is a trap crop plant alone sufficient. Uh, management, more often than not, has to be added into the program um, to make it um, a successful uh, alternative for, for pest management. <clears throat> And so in this case, um, we simply took um, a pest management tool, if you will, that was uh, pre-existing in the system. These are uh, tractor-mounted vacuums uh, and util utilized them for um, ligus bug removal in alfalfa trap crops. <clears throat> so again, uh, here are the, uh, the three hoods. Uh, there is a fan um, that creates a suction. Uh, ligus bugs and all other insects, um, they get um, pulled into that hood, into that fan, uh, they get diced up by the fan and then spit up as an acetyl insect mulch um, uh, through the vents right there. <coughs> on the next slide you can see, um, we can focus on the nymphs here at the bottom. Uh, the darker gray uh, are nymphal densities per 50 suctions <coughs> Excuse me, um, in an unvacuum trap crop. So uh, we have um, almost uh, one nymph per suction um, in these sort of midsummer samples. But when you vacuum the trap crop, um, here's the nymphal density. It goes way, way down. So there's obviously a, a considerable and statistically significant difference between um, ligus bug nymph densities um, in vacuumed and unvacuumed trap crops. Uh, generally speaking, um, the ligus bug reductions um, are about 80% and 90% of adults and nymphs, respectively. Um, now, there are a couple caveats to this. Um, these reduction rates were, were done um, with a trap crop that was um, vacuumed twice weekly, and there were two consecutive passes. Uh, now, it seems like that second pass is not necessary. Um, the number of passes per week um, is sort of up for debate. One may be sufficient. Uh, another really important consideration is the size of the alfalfa trap crop. Um, the alfalfa trap crop that you see in this picture here um, is sort of a nice size. It's not too tall. It's not too uh, sort of wide. Um, the larger and, and broader and denser it gets, um, the, the less successful you are at um, removing those nymphs um, with a, a vacuum. <clears throat> Okay, so now we know we can attract ligus bugs to a trap crop and we can manage them in an organically compliant manner uh, in that trap crop as well. So we do have a, successful, a successfully managed trap crop. <clears throat> Next on our agenda was to determine um, sort of the spatial distribution um, between trap crops. So in other words, you know, what, were, what was the spatial pattern uh, or the dispersion of ligus bugs um, from one trap crop to the next? Uh, the, the farm... Uh, one of the farms that we do a lot of research on, uh, they have alfalfa trap crops planted every 50 rows. <clears throat> so we use the same technique. Here's Scott again applying, um, I'm going to guess this is milk. I could be wrong, but it looks like milk on an uh, alfalfa trap crop. 
And we then wanted to look at how um, ligus bugs dispersed from that trap crop. Um, and we, uh, so here's the, the central uh, trap crop uh, that was applied with a protein. And we looked at uh, the adjacent three strawberry rows, SB1, 2, and 3, uh, moving both east and west. Uh, the strawberry row 10 rows away, and then the alfalfa trap crop that was 50 rows away. And we did this uh, one day, two days, and two weeks after that protein mark was applied. And so what you can see is that there's a tremendous retention um, of ligus bug adults in this central trap crop. Uh, this is important. Um, this has been brought up recently as, a, as a, an additional component of trap crop success, not only attractiveness, but retention. How well um, are your pests retained in that trap crop? Um, the theory goes, and, and correctly so, I would imagine, the more um, pests that use that trap crop as a source to move into your crop, um, the, the more difficult it is to achieve commercial success. Uh, what was interesting um, to see was these adults fly from one trap to the next. That was pretty neat to see. So similarly, <clears throat> the same setup, but we look at uh, ligus bug nymphs, and we see the same pattern. Um, there's a, a great retention. There, there's a bit more destructive sampling, you can see. In other words, we removed uh, nymphs um, on consecutive days, and that seems to have reduced the overall number. Um, but you do see uh, nymphs um, stay within um, what becomes a three-row universe. And this is pretty common um, that nymphs do spill over into an adjacent strawberry row on either side. And that's a pattern that's pretty consistent. Um, and, and we see that here. <clears throat> What's also interesting and surprising um, is that you see uh, ligus bug nymphs that go 50 rows. They Some of them left the central trap crop and they went 50 rows over into the adjacent trap crop. Um, and they did that within 24 hours. Um, that was uh, definitely an indication that these small insects uh, without wings um, are, are, are much better dispersers than we give them credit for. <clears throat> if you want to look at this sort of basically the same pattern, um, but with respect to just sort of a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, abundant uh, without using marking techniques. Uh, so these were um, biweekly samples that were collected from uh, July through September. Uh, you can see the, the nymphal abundance is per 200 suction um, in a trap crop, uh, another trap crop, and then row one, uh, 12 rows away from a trap crop, and then this sort of the, the middle strawberry row in between these two trap crops. You see this nice sort of bimodal or, or U-shaped pattern of, of ligus bugs, uh, such that um, the densities in rows from rows 12 to 25 are really, really low. Uh, they are absolutely below economic thresholds. And when you combine this with other research that, um, that we did uh, in our 2000 pub 2007 publication, um, it establishes that these interior populations um, are below economic thresholds, almost always. Um, Every once in a while, there's some management, there's some vacuuming that needs to be done when ligus sort of peak. Um, but for the most part, um, you can let your, your uh, beneficial insects um, operate in this sort of interior zone in an undisturbed fashion. <clears throat> and instead, you can focus your management efforts where you know your pests are. Right now, you have a spatial uh, cue as to where your pests are aggregated. And they're, they're aggregated in the trap crop and in the adjacent two rows of strawberries. And if you add those three rows up every 50 rows, then it's about 7% of your total acreage. Um, so you know that, look, I, most of my pet, the vast majority of my pests are going to be on 7%. And so rather than vacuuming every single strawberry row um, every single week, you can focus your, your management, your, your vacuuming, your fuel, your labor um, on that 7%. Um, and, you know, look, when, when pests reach their peak levels, then you can go back and do the interior if that's necessary. Um, but sometimes that's not necessary, or oftentimes that's not necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. If we look at uh, percent strawberry damage, uh, if we compare vacuum trap crops or strawberries 
that are adjacent to vacuum trap crops that are not vacuumed, the strawberries are not vacuumed themselves, with strawberries that are vacuumed without a trap crop. Um, and you compare the, the various months, uh, five out of seven months, you have significant reductions in damage uh, when you have a vacuum dust off a trap crop. This is more recent. The, the previous graph or the previous table is from 2004. This is from, <coughs> excuse me, from 2012. Um, these are strawberries with a trap crop. These are strawberries without a trap crop. Uh, here's mean percent damage. Uh, this is from this data. These data were collected from uh, July, August, and September. Um, you can see there's a, a significant reduction uh, in damage. Uh, with percent damage uh, when strawberries are with a trap crop as opposed to without. Uh, or the converse of that is, you know, how many marketable um, undamaged strawberries do you have? And you get the inverse, right? So there are more marketable strawberries eligible for the fresh market, that is, um, in strawberry rows with a trap crop than without. But going back to the 2004 example, uh, this leads to some interesting economics. Um, so if you have more plants producing more marketable fruit, um, then <coughs> you have a higher crop yield, right? You can see uh, this is uh, $90,000 uh, in strawberries with a vacuum trap crop, and those strawberries are not vacuumed. Uh, you can compare that to $86,000, almost $87,000, uh, and all of these values are per hectare. <clears throat> the next sort of uh, point of interest here um, is your vacuuming cost. If you're only vacuuming uh, the trap crop and the adjacent strawberry rows, you're saving a lot of money relative to strawberry rows that are vacuumed, every single strawberry row that's vacuumed, right? It, it, you're saving a lot of money on these management costs. And so your net profit per hectare is fairly substantial. <clears throat> and this has led to some widespread adoption of alfalfa trap cropping. Um, when we last checked, um, I believe it was 2011, um, there was, at least the, the estimates that we came up with, had about 27, 28% um, of the organic strawberry acreage um, on the central coast um, had alfalfa trap crops. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit um, and uh, discuss a case study of classical biological control um, that utilizes um, alfalfa trout crops for successful establishment. This is, of course, uh, Peristinus or Peristinus relictus. This is a braconid parasitoid um, that is a na native to Europe. Uh, collections were originally made uh, in Italy and Spain. Uh, they were quarantined uh, with host testing done <coughs> excuse me, uh, at the USDA laboratory in France uh, before shipments were made to California. So this is a, a specialist on ligus bugs. It's a nymphal parasitoid. It lays an egg inside of ligus bug nymphs. Uh, ligus bugs here um, are, uh, uh, there is no uh, nymphal parasitoid. Uh, somehow they, they seem to have uh, avoided that um, uh, parasite niche. And so uh, we decided to, with the help of uh, Charlie Pickett at CDFA, um, use alfalfa trap crops as a release point. You can see how small they are relative to, <coughs> excuse me, 12 point text in the top right hand corner of the slide. Um, it was um, thought that the higher host densities that are available in alfalfa trap crops would be would in, improve the likelihood of establishment uh, for this parasitoid. Here's Charlie sweeping, looking for the, the um, parasitized nymphs. And they were collected and put in alcohol, and, and then they were dissected to search for the internal uh, uh, larvae. <coughs> Excuse me. And here you can see a nymph with a uh, relictus uh, larvae. And another. and another. So in other words, these are all nymphs that have been parasitized. An egg was laid by that wasp um, that hatched out into a little larvae. Um, the larvae, <coughs> excuse me, um, ended up consuming the, uh, the inside of the nymph that eventually killed the nymph. 
um, and then when this nymph, I'm sorry, when the larvae is ready to pupate, it emerges from the nymph, um, goes down and pupates uh, in the leaf litter. <clears throat> when you look at the spatial distribution of parasitism in this system, uh, you have nymphs, which are the solid line, and the larvae, um, which are the, the dashed line. In the same system that you saw before, right? So here are trap crops on either end, and then the, the strawberry rows um, at particular distances away from those trap crops. So um, this is the strawberry rows adjacent to this trap crop, 12 rows away, and then the middle point uh, between the two trap crops. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> There's a very tight correlation, uh, spatially speaking, between um, how many hosts are available and how many nymphs are parasitized, as measured by the number of larvae per sample. So, I guess it's not surprising that you know where the the most hosts are available, the most parasitism takes place. <clears throat> okay, there's a lot going on in this graph, um, but it's we, we can we can walk through it uh, step by step here. So this is the same um, look at marked alfalfa in the center. So this is protein marking. So here's the marked alfalfa, um, and here are the rows away, the strawberry rows away from marked alfalfa, one through three, row 10, and then the alfalfa, which is 50 rows away. Um, the collections that were made one day, two days, and 14 days after the protein mark uh, have different uh, color legends. Um, if it's red, blue or green, those are uh, adult parasitoids <clears throat> that were collected but were not um, marked, that they, they did not have a protein mark on them. Uh, if it's in this, <clears throat> excuse me, a black at day one, two, or 14 um, with a particular pattern, a, a hatching pattern, um, those were captured and marked. So in 2008, we had very low densities. Um, all of the adult parasitoids that we captured, either marked or unmarked, um, were from alfalfa trap crop. In 2009, densities were much higher, um, but still we, the um, vast majority of adults that we captured that were marked remained in this marked alfalfa trap crop. In other words, um, they either remained in that trap crop um, or they um, returned to that trap crop by the time of sampling. So again, um, you are able to retain the host, and so you retain, to a large extent, the um, parasitoid as well. <clears throat> and when you look at uh, how this parasitoid operates, again, on a spatial scale, you can see that these trap crops and the adjacent rows really do act as sort of epicenters for parasitism. Uh, one way to look at it <clears throat> is if you just take alfalfa by itself, um, you have 70% of parasitism, again, as defined by the larval abundance of this parasitoid, 70% of parasitism found on 2% of your total acreage. Another component of this program that would begin to describe how well biological control um, was integrated into mechanical or pneumatical control uh, is whether or not vacuuming compromised the ability of this parasitoid to do its job. In other words, if most of this parasitism is taking place in alfalfa and you have these very large, very powerful machines going through, <clears throat> is that compromising the ability of uh, parasitic to parasitize its host. And surprisingly, it doesn't, at least if you measure it by percent parasitism. Uh, so in other words, um, the percent of um, nymphs that are parasitized relative to the total number of nymphs possible, um, that percentage doesn't change in alfalfa that has been vacuumed in blue or alfalfa that has not been vacuumed in uh, the maroon color. <clears throat> and so regardless of whether or not there's a lot of parasitism taking place, uh, such as 2007 and 2009, or, or much less, such as 2008 and 2010, um, relative to uh, vacuumed or unvacuumed alfalfa, that doesn't seem to affect parasitism. And so this, again, indicates that you do have a, a successful integration of a biological control program um, on top of um, a managed trap cropping program. And with that, um, I'll pose, are there any questions?
So with that, let's move on to the questions here. Um, here's one about um, whether you have to keep the alfalfa physiologically young in order to retain its attractiveness to ligus bugs over the duration of the season. Somewhat, yes. Um, I will say that the, <clears throat> the life cycle of alfalfa is very compatible with the, the growing season of strawberries. Um, they're both planted at the same time um, in, the, in the, the fall or winter. Um, when ligus bugs become an issue in late spring, um, that's when alfalfa begins to flower. <clears throat> By the time you reach mid to late summer, um, the alfalfa usually needs to be cut back, trimmed back a little bit, um, just for uh, improving the efficacy of the vacuum. Um, and so if you do that, um, that seems to sort of reinvigorate the, um, the alfalfa um, sufficiently. As long as the alfalfa is receiving the same irrigation and fertility treatment as the strawberries, uh, which is the case, right, the, in this system, um, they're bedded and have drip irrigation and fertigation the exact same way um, that strawberries do. As long as that's the case, um, then you tend to get a, a, a high degree of compatibility between alfalfa and strawberries. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know whether there are other cra trap crops that can be used for ligus bug in addition to alfalfa. There may be, um, but again, we're looking for something that is really compatible with strawberry production. Um, that means that it would have to uh, be a, a long living uh, plant, um, very durable. Uh, it couldn't uh, be a source of weeds for strawberries. Uh, it would need to be uh, compatible with the weather uh, on, on the central coast and with the irrigation and fertility treatments. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> if you had a, a small flower that was relatively short-lived, um, that might be very attractive to ligus bugs and maybe even to their parasitoids. Um, but if that um, sort of it completes its entire life cycle, say within six weeks, um, as that dies back, you now have created a source um, for for your past because it has nowhere to go now except for into your strawberries. <laughs> um, so something needs to be long living. Um, again, strawberries are grown. They can be grown from they start harvesting in maybe March, um, and harvest can extend through November. Um, so if something is shorter than that, uh, then you're potentially creating a problem. Okay. Um, how do you go about cutting back the alfalfa? Yeah, there are different ways of doing it. Um, <clears throat> I think the the easiest, though, um, is just using a, a sickle um, or a, a, a machete, a sort of sort of a knife, just a handheld knife. Um, and it's a little bit of a balancing act. Um, you definitely want to make sure that the sides of the trap crop um, don't sort of fall over into the furrow uh, because that, that begins to interfere with uh, strawberry harvest. And you don't want it to be so tall that it shades the strawberry plant. You don't want to reduce yield. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that there are flowers um, on the alfalfa, right? That is a key component to attractiveness. Um, so it's a little bit of a balancing act, right? You want it to be as small as possible um, in order to uh, encourage maximum removal with the alfalfa, with the, the vacuum. Um, but at the same time, you want there to be flowers. Okay. Um, someone said this control technique seems incredibly interesting. Would this work for other species, pest control as well? Possibly. Um, there are several components that go into trap cropping. Uh, mobility um, is one. Um, that plant host preference is another. Uh, and then it, because these two, these, both of these components tie into attractiveness and the ability for retention, right? So you need something that, um, you need insects that are attractive enough and are strong enough flyers to be able to, you know, really seek out one plant um, and then stay there uh, and then ideally be managed by either a vacuum or cutting or spraying. Um, so it's, there have been some, some really great modeling papers that have been done in the last 10 years <clears throat> that begin to look at sort of the building blocks, the theoretical building blocks for, for what makes a good trap cropping system. Uh, so with ligus bug adults, right, you have um, a very mobile uh, flyer. Uh, it has strong preferences, is able to act upon those preferences, right? It doesn't sort of just, it's not carried by the wind and randomly land on one plant or another. Um, and then 
Uh, once there, it can lay eggs and feed preferentially on alfalfa. Uh, that can be managed with uh, a, a management device that was, is already present in the system, um, and it does tend to encourage biological control as well. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there are other ways to apply this um, in, in this sort of multidimensional manner. Um, it, it just takes a little bit of sort of thinking <laughs> about compatibility. Yeah. Um, are there any issues with disease transferring to strawberries from alfalfa? That's a really good question. We started thinking about this this year particularly. Um, this was a, a bad year for um, fungal uh, pathogens for plants, um, and so there was uh, a lot of, this was an unusually high year for alfalfa to have sort of uh, all sorts of different um, diseases. Um, I, we started thinking about uh, verticillium resistance in alfalfa, whether or not that could be a carrier. Um, it, to be honest, we're not sure yet. We haven't seen any um, sort of anecdotal correlation between plant disease and strawberries and um, sort of proximity to alfalfa. <clears throat> uh, but if you are if you are sort of in a really vulnerable spot, um, that might be something to consider, something to watch out for. I, I don't. We haven't seen any evidence of it, but it's it, it should be looked into for sure. Okay. Um, how effective would a trap crop be if it were only on the perimeter of the field rather than interspersed every 50 rows? <clears throat> I think it would be very effective. Um, so to be honest, we don't have any um, any studies or any data that justify spacing at 50. Um, in other words, we haven't compared it to you know spacing at 40 or, or 60 or 100 or just a perimeter. Um, I think the most conservative route um, if someone is thinking about just, you know, trying this out, uh, would be just a, a perimeter. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly the most um, the most convenient. It works really well in capturing immigrants. In other words, the the, the bugs that go from um, adjacent weeds into a field. Um, it's amazing to see, sort of in the late spring, uh, you can see the first adults in your field, and you know exactly where to look because they're in the trap crop. You can see. And you can see them building up. They go from you know two to you know four to eight to um, all of a sudden they're at 16 and 20. And you can look and look and look in your strawberries, and it takes a lot of effort to find just one adult. Um, or you can spend 30 seconds looking in a trap crop and find them. And so it gives you a really good sense as to where they are. <coughs> um, I think again, and if you don't, the problem is the management component of this is this sort of large. Um, relatively expensive uh, piece of machinery um, that kind of limits the the uh, transferability of this technique. Um, but one thing to experiment with might be uh, to have this on the perimeter <clears throat> just for immigrating that immigrating generation, um, sort of capture them and then you know cut the, the trap crop down um, once you've ensured egg length to place on the alfalfa rather than strawberries. Um, that would be one sort of idea. Um, would this technique apply outside of California? Do you know, have any experience or knowledge of anybody else who's tried it um, in other areas? I have. Um, they they tried it in Ontario, I believe, up in Canada, um, for Ligus linearis. I don't know how successful it was. I, I I've seen some sort of extension uh, information online. I haven't seen any any pubs about that. Um, They've experimented with a little bit in Europe, um, and they're starting to apply it a little bit in Latin America. Um, but it, that's just sort of the, the initial phases. So, um, yeah, I think I think so. But every system is a little bit different, and so the particulars need to get tweaked um, in order to, you know, to, to best utilize the, the dynamics of a particular system. Okay. Someone wanted to know whether you could use a weed whacker to cut back the alfalfa. Yeah, we initially used a weed whacker. Um, it seemed to make a big old mess. It just seemed to be <laughs> make a big, big mess. Um, and we eventually ditched that and went with just a handheld sickle or, or knife, and that um, seemed to be easier. Uh, it, it, again, it depends sort of just what your preference is. But yeah. Um, yeah, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, we ended up ditching the weed whacker. Okay. I know you touched on this a little um, before when you were talking about um, why you use alfalfa, um, but um, it's a question about what the challenges are with using successional plantings of shorter living trap crops versus a single planting of a long living trap crop. 
<clears throat> well, anytime you you increase the complex complexity um, of a system uh, with respect to uh, management, uh, in other words, what's required of the grower, uh, you make it exponentially less likely that, go that they are going to adopt it. Um, we found it to be surprisingly challenging um, for growers just to, you know, add one more seed into their into their planting program. In other words, you know, instead of strawberries, it's strawberries and alfalfa. Mm -hmm. um, but that that one extra step has been um, uh, prohibitive for a lot of growers to adopt. Um, so now if you say, well, all right, let's add two or three or four that you have to plant in this sort of successive order and you have to do so really carefully and you make sure that this seed goes in um, in time so that when the, the, the previous flower, uh, you know, doesn't die out by itself, it has something else to go to. Um, and especially when those plantings need to go in during peak sort of uh, yield, during peak harvest, um, now you're asking the grower to do much more than they are probably um, willing to, to put up with. Mm -hmm. um, right? When you, you plant alfalfa, when you plant your strawberries, when you put your strawberry transplants in the ground, um, and then you're done. Uh, there's yeah. weeding for sure. I mean, so very immature alfalfa is not competitive at all relative to weeds. Um, but during your peak harvest, when you're running around and, you know, you've got orders for, for this buyer and this buyer and this buyer, and they're saying, okay, you need to be very careful about putting seeds in here and here and here and here. <clears throat> they just don't seem very um, willing to put up with that sort of thing. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned the lightest numbers being below um, threshold. What threshold is being used? That's a great question. Um, we tend to <laughs> use one that's different than than what's recommended by UC. I think, um, and this isn't official at all. Uh, well, so for the publication, we use the official UC uh, threshold, right? We, uh, I think it's one per uh, one nymph per ten suctions, if, if my memory is correct. Um, but so for our day to day sort of uh, operations, um, we tend to go two nymphs per fifty suctions. It's sort of a nice um, uh, idea as to in an organic system with sufficient predators and parasitoids, uh, what's kind of the limit of what um, what should be there before your damage gets out of hand. Um, and again, sort of a casual amount of damage in an organic system, sort of big strawberry production. Um, we haven't used it as sort of a threshold as such, but you know, 5%. Um, if you have 5% damage in an organic system, that's pretty tolerable. If you get above that, that that's much less acceptable. Um, so two nymphs per 50 suctions is sort of our, our unofficial um, threshold. Um, and, and again, it's not used in any pubs, but that's sort of what we use out in the field to, to sort of say, hey, I think um, I think things are okay. Or if you get up to three or four, now, okay, you need to start vacuuming in the strawberries. Okay. Um, we have another um, question from another region. Um, it says here, um, Chandler berries are finished and plants are pulled by early June in the Mid-South. So would a trap crop be a value? Boy, um, <laughs> so I'm not familiar with uh, how ligus move in the south. Um, if your if your ligus don't immigrate until um, June, uh, then I, it might not be useful. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I'm not sure. It, it it has to sync up. If you can get flowering alfalfa in the spring. Um, in the south, you can't in, on the central coast. It's too cool. Um, but if you can get flowering alfalfa that's attractive in the spring in the south, and that corresponds to when ligus are a problem, then yeah, it could work. Um, but I, I'd have to know where ligus are coming from, when, and um, how alfalfa acts sort of in that climate zone. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, are you familiar with any studies on ligus control? Com um, let's see. I think this means combining trap cropping with conservation biological control. Yeah, we're starting to get there. Um, we're <clears throat> you're starting to see those types of studies, um, and we're starting to uh, now that uh, our our classically introduced parasitoid has been established, um, we're sort of changing our mindset to look at um, Peristinus relictus not as a classical biological control project, but a conservation biological control project. Um, to say, you know, these increased host densities. Um, they provide for better biological control. Um, and we've started comparing parasitism rates in strawberries 
uh, with and without alfalfa to see if there's a difference, if sort of parasitism acts as a sinker or source um, as you move out of the strawberries. Um, but also with general predators, right? Um, if you have greater aggregations of prey items um, and you have generalist predators that are kind of flaky, they'll eat ligus bugs if they're around, but they don't have to. Um, you know, does this change predator behavior and make it more likely that they'll eat ligus bugs? Um, so I think, yeah, the, the aggregation of a particular host or prey item in a particular spot, I think that has tremendous value, or at least tremendous potential, um, for improving conservation biological control. Uh, I mean, forever, Conservation BC has been focused on nutrition, um, on supplementing and predators and parasitoids with um, with nectar or pollen, um, and there's there's certainly utility in that. There's there's, but providing conservation BC instead with with greater host or prey abundance is uh, an alternative model that I think deserves some attention. Okay, um, let's see. Um, does the trap crop? Um, risk being attractive to other insects. Um, let's see, I, I'm not sure I understand the question here, but I think that's the gist of it here. Um, yeah. that it might attack, attract other pests. Well, yes and no. Um, so a pest, as I see it, is an herbivore that causes damage in your commercial crop above economic threshold. We have lots of herbivores that are attracted to alfalfa, but they don't do any damage in strawberries. Mm -hmm. um, they're pests in other crops, but they're not pests in strawberries. I don't know why cucumber beetles are so attracted to alfalfa, but midsummer, our trap crops are loaded with cucumber beetles, um, absolutely loaded. Uh, also, late, late summer, early fall, we usually get a, a spike of aphids. Um, a really, really big spike. <clears throat> but again, they don't do any damage. They're not a species of aphid that does any damage in strawberry. So we do get spikes of herbivores that are commercially relevant in other crops, but not strawberries. Um, I don't, it, it's interesting, it would be really interesting to do sort of a, a community um, assessment of their effects on just life in a trap crop when you get, <laughs> you know, tons and tons of, of cukes or aphids. You know, how does that affect um, host searching behavior by relictus, or how does that affect um, the ability of, of a ligus bug nymph to find a good feeding spot? You know, those sorts of things are interesting. Um, so I guess yes and no, right? They are attractive to other herbivores, um, but they don't seem to be um, economically relevant in strawberries. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have one more question here. Um, in Maine, um, growers tend not to use vacuums. Would a tra trap crop that is not vacuumed help control or tarnish plant bug for June bearing berries? It's been my experience that unmanaged trap crops are not only not effective, but they're counterproductive. They increase damage. <clears throat> um, so, um, Initially, I would say, no, absolutely don't do that. Um, however, if you're very good, if you just want to capture, like I said, the immigrating population, um, and you can figure out when the adults come in and kind of gauge by degree days when they might lay eggs, and then cut that off off and down, like down to a, a stub, um, and then try and uh, uh, prevent it from reestablishing, like that might be an okay use. That would take a lot of uh, sort of monitoring, um, but that could be something you would do. But again, if it's something that you want to have up year round um, and not manage, I, I highly discourage it. Um, I just got a, a recent account of someone who tried it um, but didn't understand that they needed to manage it. <clears throat> and he said, first half of the season, it was amazing. Second half of the season, it was a nightmare. And that's <laughs> absolutely how it goes. Um, it's, it's really, really great. It you know sort of focuses all of your, all of your pets into one place. Um, but if you don't then kill all of those pests, then they become uh, a much bigger problem. Okay, it looks like we're getting a couple more questions here. Um, I guess we still have another 15 minutes or so. So if you want to continue discussing, you should type in your questions. Um, in the um, Pacific Northwest, um, we also have slugs and snails. I know in California you do as well. Um, what about using geese or 
I guess, question mark here to handle both mollusks and ligus bugs. Do you have any experience with that? Uh, boy, um, I I have seen a few more snails as the years sort of you know continue on. Um, I but I I don't think I've seen any noticeable preference for one plant or the other. I don't think. Um, I again, you can kind of go back to mobility, the ability mobility of the pest, the ability to detect plant differences from a distance, and then act upon them. Um, <clears throat> so let, my answer is I don't know, um, but you could, if you think a mollusk is more likely to slither its way through <laughs> um, strawberries to get through a, to get to a, a trap cropper. If you have it on an edge, if it's more likely to stay in the alfalfa or some other plant, um, maybe, yeah. I mean, these things don't move quickly, so you have time. Once they're on a, a board or trap crop, you could manage them with sluggo or something else um, pretty effectively. I haven't, I, yeah, I, I've never given any thought to, to mollusk pest control with trap crops. That's a really interesting application. Um, hmm. It would take some, some testing. It would take some experimenting. Um, uh, but I, theoretically, I suppose it could. Yeah. Okay, I guess here's a question about whether conventional growers could use a trap crop and then spray the trap crop with a conventional insecticide to reduce the amount of total spray used and manage the bugs. Well, yes. So we, we have worked in that, um, and that ended up being a pretty challenging work environment um, for a couple different reasons. But um, I will say that we have seen significant ligus bug reductions in sprayed alfalfa trap crops. Um, so that does work. Um, it, you have to tweak your, your boom and your spray nozzles a little bit, um, it, but you can get it done. Um, and we've also seen when growers are successful at basically melding the two growing styles, organic and conventional, <clears throat> it can be tremendously successful. So in other words, um, they spend spring and the first half of the summer operating as an organic grower. So they have their vacuum and they have the trap crop and they vacuum as necessary. Um, if things get a little, um, if, if ligus bugs start to get a little bit more dense, in the strawberries, they can vacuum the strawberries, and they don't go to their first spray until several, several weeks after uh, their neighbors do. And they use far fewer sprays. We've seen reductions of up to 75, 80% in total insecticides used um, by these growers who are really good at adopting um, and integrating these two approaches. Um, so you're, you're, sp you're spending less on insecticide and you're getting much better bang for your buck with each spray because you're not dealing with resistance. Right, you're not spraying these things into a, a point of resistance like like other folks that don't have these kind of preventative tools. Um, we have a question about vacuums. Um, you know whether they're avail whether I guess I, I don't completely understand the question, but I think um, it's about whether um, you could whether they're available commercially on a small scale and how much it would cost. Boy. <clears throat> They're not, and that's something that we actually want to fundraise for really badly, uh, if mm -hmm. there are any granting agencies out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we really want to make this technique um, usable for small-scale strawberry growers because we've seen it time and time again. They don't really have anything. Um, right? This, this tractor-mounted vacuum device is uh, anywhere from thirty to $50,000. Um, and that's obviously something that a small grower can't afford. So if we instead we could develop a small um, sort of push back, in other words, just a, a single row, you know, push vacuum, mm. um, that would all of a sudden open up this technique, this pest, man pest management technique, to small scale growers, um, because it's it's so unfortunate to see um, a situation where you don't really have any any sprays that that work, um, and you don't have any sort of mechanical controls that work, and by July, August, September, your ligus bugs are just out of control, hmm. just out of control, um, and there's, there's not much they can do. Um, so this is definitely a, a very sort of acute need, um, and it wouldn't take um, very much. Uh, we sort of already have all the resources in place, all the, the we, we have the, the folks who could design the machine, um, we have uh, 
scientists or growers who would be willing to adopt it. Um, we basically just need uh, some funding to get it done. But yeah, that's a wonderful suggestion and something that we very badly uh, want to tackle. Well, thank you, Diego. Um, this has been a very interesting presentation, um, and it looks like we've gotten to the end of our question. So I'd like to thank everyone who asked the question, and uh, mention once again that you can find um, this and um, our many other upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics um, at the link on your screen. So thank you again, Diego, for um, giving this presentation today and the other members of the CalCore group. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us online today.